All right, so let's start from the beginning. Um, uh, so this is sort of the pre-history. Let's go over some of these concepts uh, somewhat quickly. But I want to start in uh, you know the 1670s. So Leibniz, Leibniz is in Paris. He's uh, going from Berlin to Paris, and there he's studying uh, astronomy with uh, Huygens. That's the best Dutch you'll get out of me. Huygens also happens to be in Paris. And Huygens challenges him. Now, I don't know, maybe historians know this, but I don't. I don't know if, if Huygens knew the answer and he gave it to Leibniz as an exercise or, he, or if he really challenged him to figure out the sum of the reciprocals of the triangular numbers. So of course, the triangular numbers are the numbers that you make out of triangles. It's not part of the triangle, right? So this is one, three, six, what is that, 10? So these are the numbers uh, k times k plus one over two. So by this, I mean the sum of two over k times k plus one. In other words, one over one plus one over three plus one over six plus one over 10 and so on. They knew enough to know that this thing converged. This is before there was maybe enough calculus around to, uh, they, they had other methods to, to know that this converges. Um, but uh, Leibniz made this, this great observation that uh, if you take one over k times k plus one, uh, if you take one over k minus one over k plus one, in fact, these two things are the same, you just cross multiply and so on. And so this sum is nothing but the two we can pull out in front. And then we're, we're left with, so this one over, uh, one over this thing is uh, one, over, um, one over one minus one over two plus a third with, which is now I've pulled out two, I've pulled out two. So this is a sixth, a sixth is a half minus a third. And a 12th is a third minus a quarter and so on. And then he just cancels the telescope and he gets that the answer is two. Okay. So this is the kind of thing that they were able to do back then very easily. Uh, and the very natural question was, so what about, what about the sum of one over the squares? So this was in fact already asked by Mengoli in 16, in the 1650s, not so much before. This was the kind of stuff that was in the air at the time, okay? So what can we say about the sum of the squares? The sum of the reciprocals of the squares, one over one plus one over four plus one over nine plus one over 16. Again, they know that this is finite. They can compute you know, to uh, lots of decimals. What do I got here? 1.64493 and so on but they had no idea what this number was. This number was came out to be a nice number too. Uh, what the hell is this thing? So uh, uh, Leibniz started popularizing this and he gave this problem to uh, the brothers, Johann and Jakob, Johann and Jakob Bernoulli, the famous Bernoulli brothers, Bernoulli, um, who, who he taught calculus and there's a whole long story about, about this. They couldn't solve it. They worked really hard on this problem. They couldn't solve it. It became known as the Basel problem. These guys are in Basel in Switzerland. Uh, and it became known as the Basel problem because anybody who came through town, uh, any mathematicians, you know, Jahan, ja Jakob and uh, Johan would, you know, take them out to dinner as, as, we, as we do. And uh, they'd say, oh, how about some of the triple squares? Can anybody figure out what this is? Anyway, so uh, as I'm sure all of you know, Euler finally settled this. Now Euler is born uh, 1707. And he finally settles this in 1734, I want to say. That's right. And he says, I know what this number is. This number is pi squared over six. Um, few people can, can understand. Euler at this point, what is this? Uh, 27, right? He's like 27 years old. 27 years old. He's struggling to find work. You think about this legendary Euler character, but actually he couldn't get a job in Switzerland, he really wanted a job in, in, uh, in Basel. He's, he's born in Basel. Uh, so this is like his problem to solve. Uh, he can't get a job in Switzerland. He's, he's now working in uh, St. Petersburg. He had to go all the way to Russia to find employment. He's 27, he's you know over the hill already. And uh, of course his whole <laughs> massive amount of uh, work, life's work is, is still ahead of him. But uh, he finally manages to solve it. Uh, solves it and becomes solves it and becomes instantly instantly world renowned world uh, famous 
for, for having done so. So I want to investigate how he does it because this is the, again, this is just on the cusp of the prehistory of what he does with, with Zeta. Okay, so here's what he does. Um, he's playing around, he's playing around, playing infinite series against infinite products, having nothing to do with primes. We're not at the Euler product formula yet, but of course that's the, that's the, the point that I'm trying to make. So he notices that this, so everybody knows the sine function, sine of X, which he knows the Taylor series too, X cubed over three factorial, X to the five over five factorial and so on. And he knows uh, that it looks like this. So it's, it's zero at all of the multiples of pi. So sine of N pi equals zero. And, uh, and he studies instead the function sine x over x. And he knows that that, so that will now be an even function instead of an odd function. So this is sine x over x. Uh, one over x is gonna look like this. And uh, he knows that at zero, this is asymptotic to one. This uh, has a limit, which is one. Sine x over x goes to one as x goes to zero. And then it still has to vanish wherever sine vanishes. So at the, at the multiples of pi, so it's doing something like, like this that, and, and getting smaller and smaller, okay? So this is sine x over x. And uh, okay, so the series, he can still work out exactly, just divide everything by, by x. So I get x squared over three factorial plus x to the fourth over five factorial and so on. And here's where, here's his logic. He knows, he knows that if f is a polynomial with f of zero equals one, f of zero equals one, and roots a1 through a n, if it's a degree n polynomial with roots a1 through a n, then, so let's make this an exercise. Uh, then he knows what that polynomial is. It's uh, one minus x over a1, times one minus X over A2 and so on, one minus X over AN. So if you have a polynomial with N roots, degree N polynomial with N roots, let's say degree N just to be clear. He, he, at the time, he's not really understanding complex roots and the fundamental theorem of uh, algebra and so on. But, but so this is, this is sort of obvious. I've given, you, uh, uh, I've given you N plus one pieces of information that this thing vanishes at these values and that its value at zero is one which you can evidently see from, from the formula. And linear algebra tells you that uh, n plus one pieces of information determine the n plus one coefficients of a degree n polynomial. So um, this, is, this is kind of trivial. So, so he knows this fact and he applies it, applies this, applies to sine x over x. And he says, what are the zeros of sine x over x? They're here at pi and at negative pi and at two pi and so on. So I'm just gonna plug in this formula. So I get one minus x over pi and one minus x over negative pi and one minus x over two pi and one minus x over negative two pi and so on. And these, he, he immediately recognizes the difference of uh, squares. So this is one minus x squared over, I guess this is one, yeah, still minus x squared over pi squared. And then these two are one minus x squared over four pi squared. And the next one is one minus x squared over nine pi squared, because it's a three and a three and so on. And then he just multiplies this out. So, so what's the coefficient of x to the zero? It's gonna be an even function, but x to the zero, does, you just take all ones, you get that. What's the coefficient of x squared? Well, there's a uh, one over pi squared in everything. And then he discovers, lo and behold, that there's a one, and uh, one quarter and uh, one ninth and so on. And that's the only way you can get an X squared out of this is by taking one of these and all ones and all the other factors as you multiply this thing out. And then there's, there's uh, higher order terms. Okay. So this is as X goes to zero, if you like, these are the, the higher order terms working with this asymptotic. So there, there it is. Now he compares this, he compares this to this, and he sees that the coefficients must align, another slight leap of faith. So one sixth is equal to one over pi squared times zeta of two. Okay, and that's his proof.
Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> so it, it's it's absolutely incredible. I agree completely. I mean, this people so people had a, a lot to uh, complain about, rightfully so. Is I I, I want to make the point that that this is this should not have been accepted as a valid proof, um, and it it wasn't. He gave a second proof later using uh, Fourier analysis. Uh, of course, this is still a hundred years before Fourier, um, but uh, but so so this can be made rigorous. Can be made rigorous with uh, what you learn in complex analysis, right? Weierstrass, Weierstrass factorization, Weierstrass Hadamard factorization theorem for entire functions. Factorization theorem for entire functions. Which is of course from the 1880s or something. But it's still clear that, you know, he had the right guess. In any case, right regardless of a, yeah, yeah. There's there's lots of times when uh, you know math is all about breaking things. You you break the rules and then you find uh, what, what's the great line? I think it's Heavy Side who said uh, this series diverges, so we can do something. You know, now we're in business. This thing diverges, like we're we're gonna have fun with it. In fact, we're about to go into much more of, of what he, uh, the kinds of rules that he's that he's breaking. But okay, so so the point is. It's already in his spidey sense that he can get something out of comparing series to products, infinite series to infinite products, okay? So um, yeah, let me give you just a couple more exercises. So exercise, use the same idea, now comparing higher order coefficients, and you have to be a little bit careful about that, to compute zeta of four and zeta of six. And yet it'll be clear that you can compute any even, uh, values of zeta. Zeta, of course, uh, I think I, well, maybe it's needless to say in this, in this audience, but zeta is this function when, of course, this is the value of zeta of two. Okay. Right. So, um, so he can do this and he, he very explicitly, he wants to know the value of zeta of three. So he's already uh, all, uh, so let me make this an exercise star. What is zeta of three? Can you can you figure it out? Euler couldn't. Um, can you even tell? I'm not even sure. I don't think it's known, uh, not known, that it's not a quadratic irrational. It is known. So a famous theory of Aperi from 1970, what eight or something. This is a quarter millennium after Euler, 250 years after Euler, uh, quarter millennium later, uh, that, it, that it's irrational. That's how long it took to get this number to, to not be a fraction, okay? What kind of, what kind of tools are used for that? <laughs> um, they're, they're not that complicated. It's not that hard. It's kind of an elementary uh, proof using Diophantine approximation. That this number, if it, if it could be approximated by rationals, then this is what the size of the rationals would have to be. And then uh, a couple of arguments later, in terms of the actual formula that he, he writes down a really uh, complicated formula for zeta of three and shows that it can't be approximated uh, by rationals. So um, we can discuss this actually. Uh, Steve Miller has a really nice uh, short proof of this. Um, there, there's a lot of beautiful, beautiful stuff there, but it's, um, yeah, not, not my focus at the moment. If you want, we can, uh, we can go over it. I mean, when we do the Diophantine approximation, we can, it's, it's not, um, it doesn't, uh, no, it does lead to, uh, lots of other things. Okay. Anyway, uh, we're not going to talk about it right now. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, but it's a great, it's a fantastic, uh, result. And just to show like 250 years after Euler, that's the best we know. Um, Okay, so Euler starts messing around with this. He's really trying to, so he's trying to understand, trying to understand anything about zeta of threes. He's messing around with uh, all kinds of identities, trying to understand zeta identities. And uh, he notices this. So already when you're, when you're proving, when you're, uh, when you're evaluating zeta of four, you need to mess around with things like, um, if you take zeta, 
So let me write it again. One plus one over two to the S plus one over three to the S, S plus one over four to the S and so on. And you multiply this thing by, you take out the, uh, I'm, I'm sort of prejudging it. Uh, you take out the two part, I, I'm saying, I'm saying something which we shouldn't yet know what's gonna happen. So, so if you just multiply it by one minus one over two to the S, what's gonna happen? Let's multiply this all out. So everything gets multiplied by one. Okay, so everything gets multiplied by one and so on. And then everything gets multiplied by negative one over two to the S. So this is minus one over two to the S, minus one over four to the S, minus one over six to the S, minus one over eight to the S and so on. Okay, so he shows, so, uh, he just cancels, he observes that he can sum the, the sums of the odds of the odd numbers, okay? Um, so this is a sum over all n such that two does not divide n of one over n to the s. And then he says, huh, that's curious. And if I take this zeta and I multiply it by this one over two to the s and I multiply that by one minus one over three to the s, then what will happen? So I take this series that's left over, all of the odd numbers, one plus three to the S plus one minus uh, uh, odd numbers, five to the S plus one minus one over seven to the S and so on. And I multiply that by one minus one over three to the S. Okay, so uh, all of these numbers get tripled. So, so first you multiply by one, which is just this. And then all the numbers get tripled. So one over three to the S minus one over uh, what is that? Uh, nine to the S minus one over 15 to the S minus one over 21 to the S and so on. So any number that had a three in it, we already removed the twos. Any number that had a three in it is also getting taken out. So this is a sum over all integers so that two and three do not divide N. Okay, one over N to the S. And then of course he, he very quickly sees that if he takes zeta of s and multiplies it by one over two to the s times one minus one over three to the s times one minus one over five to the s and so on, taking out all the primes, that will be the sum over all numbers which are co-prime to all primes. And the only number that's co-prime to all the primes is one. And so he's discovered the Euler product formula. So this is, this is 1737. Just a few years later, he's still messing around with these things. And he's discovered the Euler product formula that this is a product over the primes. I have to bring this to the other side. So one minus one over P to the S inverse. Okay. And uh, of course, once he does that, he's, uh, he's gonna do something uh, really great with it. All right, let me give you a little exercise. Does he actually derive this um, like this in yes. one of his papers? Yes, <laughs> oh, wow. it's exactly this, this process. He just multiplies, multiplies this and sees what happens and, and the only thing that's left over. So this is, this is basically completely equivalent to the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Every, every number uh, fundamental right. theorem of arithmetic, every number is uniquely uh, represented by products of powers of primes. But usually the way people do this is they, they open this up as a series. Uh, in other words, the way the way people you see people often prove this is to is to report that one minus one over x is one plus x plus x squared plus x right. cubed that it's a geometric series and so they say okay this is one plus one over p to the s plus one over p to the two s plus one over p to the three s and so on and so when you multiply all of this out every prime power gets multiplied to every number uniquely and that's why I think this comes out to uh, one over n to the s for every every integer so this one right. is the fundamental theorem but he's doing it like formally right so it's not like uh that's right this is before epsilons and deltas and so on and and of course this wouldn't count as a complete proof today uh you want to take the difference of the two series and see that when you when you've taken a finite product here that the numbers left over are large and then evaluate how you know that the that as uh the product goes to infinity as the number of primes you take here uh grows this the difference goes to zero, this kind of thing, uh, which you can do. Okay, so with this, let me give you a, little, a fun little exercise. So show that, I mean, it's a one line 
uh, exercise, but it's a it's a fun identity that I like. Two over root, so I take root six, I multiply it by two over root three. I multiply that by three over root eight. I multiply that by five over root 24. I multiply that by seven over root 48. I multiply that by 11 over root 120. You see what I'm doing? Multiply that by what's 13 squared? 169, 168. So you take all the primes and divide by square root of one less than the square. And that will come out to pi. So here's a crazy way to compute pi if you so choose. Okay, so completely uh, elementary exercise from the things that you already know. All right, the other thing that he knows, so, so we're leading up to uh, the, the birth of analytic number theory. The other thing that he knows, I mean, you could say this, this is a cute identity, I guess, uh, doesn't get you too much. He knows that zeta of s, let's see, I'll just write it as zeta of one is infinity, i.e. Uh, zeta of s goes to infinity as s goes to one from the right, which is the only place where it's, it's defined as, as, uh, as things stand. Uh, and by the way, this was Men Mengoli. Uh, he's following the proof of Mengoli also from the 1650s, who gives a nice proof of this divergence. So this is called the divergence of the harmonic series, right? This is uh, one plus a half plus a third plus a fourth plus a fifth. These are the harmonics uh, ratios of whole numbers that the Pythagoreans were studying. So this is divergence. This is the divergence of harmonic series, which uh, he's crediting Mengoli, but it turns out people didn't know this at the time, but Oris May in the 14, 1350s already, already gave a, a proof of this divergence. Um, anyway, so this is certainly something that's in Euler's uh, uh, tool bag. And he knows that log of infinity is also infinity. So what does he do? He looks at log, so log of zeta also goes to infinity as s goes to one. But what is log of zeta? Log of zeta, so zeta is this product over the primes, this product over the primes. So log of zeta is a sum. So uh, if I take log, that minus sign comes down, minus log of one minus one over p to the s. Okay. He also knows, uh, I always have to derive this from scratch. We know how to sum a geometric series. So if I integrate all of this, then I get an x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 and so on is a negative log of 1 minus x. So he knows this uh, power expansion for, for x. Of course, if you want things to be formally correct, this is only when x has uh, absolute value less than 1, for example. Uh, certainly uh, for absolute value of x less than a half, um, we have that this thing is equal to uh, x plus big O of x squared. So as x goes to zero with it, with a um, uh, explicit constant uh, independent of anything. So should I give you an exercise? Uh, exercise, exercise, uh, evaluate this constant. Uh, give explicit constant here, give explicit constant for absolute value of x less than a half. Anyway, so this uh, one over p to the s, p is at least two, right? We, we have primes here. So one over p to the s is also, s is bigger than one. So, uh, so this is also less than a half, which means this sum is a sum over the primes. I mean, all the primes. And then x, which is one over p to the s, plus big O of sum over all the primes, one over p to the two s. But this is bounded by the sum over all numbers, one over n squared, which is finite. So this, this is big O of one. And uh, therefore, and this diverges. So this must diverge. Then for, therefore, the sum of the primes, the reciprocals of primes diverges. That's it. It's completely elementary, you know, one line kind of stuff. Uh, and as a corollary, there are there exist infinitely many primes. Of course, this was known already to Euclid, as we said, in 300 BC, 350 BC or something. Okay. So um, 
So this, this I, I consider doing analysis with primes to prove it's not, it's not a great, it is the birth to me, the birth of analytic number theory. So this is the birth of analytic number theory using analysis and not, you know, uh, combinatorics or some kind of uh, discrete math type argument, but really using calculus to, uh, to show something about some basic question about the primes. Um, it's of course, uh, not until, uh, not until uh, Dirichlet, that the power of this method is uh, that the power of this method uh, of this idea is uh, taken to its its fruition uh, flowers. But but already uh, Euler's done some some great stuff. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, could I just make a comment, please? Yeah, so I was just going to say that, um, I mean, I don't think this is what Euler did or like historically in line, but um, that you could also get, you know, like asymptotics for the sum of reciprocals of primes like this or something, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the rate at which this blows up as S goes to one, right. which it doesn't do. So that'll get you a rate at which the sum of the reciprocals of the primes uh blows up exactly right just in case anybody's interested that might also be a good exercise oh absolutely yeah okay great let's add it as an exercise exercise uh use these ideas well it, uh, together with you have to prove that zeta of s is uh one over one minus s s minus one s minus one plus big o of s minus one squared as s goes to one uh, so the first thing you should do is, uh, prove this and then, so exercise one, prove this and two, use these ideas to find the rate, um, the rate. Well, I guess, yeah. Um, you, you may also want to know that the sum of one over N up to X is, uh, log X plus you know, uh, big O of one, I guess. You, you might need a little bit more. Anyway, to, to find uh, the asymptotic formula for the sum of, of one over primes. So yeah, it'll grow like log log X. Yeah, in the Laurent expansion, I think there's a plus gamma, right? Uh, yes, if the lower order term. Yeah. Yeah. You mean, you mean this? Oh, the one above. The, for zeta. For here. zeta, yeah. Um, one over s minus one plus gamma plus higher lower higher the term this oh sorry yes plus uh let me just say yeah plus gamma plus uh, uh let me just say plus big o of one <laughs> absolutely there's a gamma what i mean is this is the order of, of blow up i don't want this to be decaying i want this to just be you know not blowing up yeah but you're absolutely right you can you can get further orders of uh uh, in this expansion. Thanks. Okay. Great. So this is, uh, as I said, the, the birth of analytic number theory, but he returns to this question. So he's still stuck on zeta of three. Zeta of three, like I like, I like problems that drive uh, inquiry and he's still stuck on zeta of three. He doesn't want to give up, doesn't uh, give up his fight against zeta of three and uh, pushes things further, pushes further. So he come back, comes back to this in a paper in 1749, which very few people I find uh, know about. So it pushes further. And um, so here's what happens in, uh, this, is, this is kind of strange. This is a little bit of, I, I don't know uh, the histor like if I'm on solid historical footing or if I'm uh, just making too much of, of this. But in, uh, I looked this up in July, July 25th, 1748, there's an annular eclipse, annular solar eclipse, right? So, so the moon is a little bit too uh, far from us. So it doesn't completely cover up the sun, but it, uh, it, it's completely contained inside the sun. And then there's this halo or, or whatever. That's what an annular solar eclipse is. And, um, and it, it was in Ukraine, in Ukraine. So uh, 
remember he's in St. Petersburg, so it's not very far. I, I, uh, perhaps Euler was inspired by it. I mean, he may have even written some papers uh, about it. This, this I, someone should, Euler uh, may have been inspired, may have been inspired to write uh, in the following way, uh, uh, his paper, his 1749 paper. So let me show it to you. No, that's not it. Uh, 1740. I don't know why it says 1768. It's 1749. Maybe maybe it came out in 1768. Anyway, it's from 1749. So he, so here it is. So so this is the the moon series and the sun series. So he has a series called uh, the moon and the sun. So there's the sun and the sun is one, uh, it's an alternating series, one minus, so he has a variable M, which we'll call S just to keep it, uh, one minus, come on, two to the S plus three to the S minus four to the S plus five to the S and so on. So that's the moon series. And he even says, this series makes no sense. I can't make sense of this. When I take S to be uh, two, then, you know, for one value, it's equal to uh, uh, after, uh, what does he say? He says something like, um, yeah, uh, when I take S equals one uh, and I take a hundred terms, the value is negative 50. When I take 101 terms, the value is positive 51. It's, it's jumping all over the place. And yet I want to convince you that the value of this thing is a quarter. So, uh, uh, so he, you know, evaluates uh, for S equals one, a uh, hundred terms give, what was it? Negative 50 and 101 terms give uh, positive 51, but he wants to convince you, he, he claims the limiting value at his at s equals one is uh, is a quarter. Now, of course, what he's doing is he's he's sort of uh, he, he he's too far ahead of his time. He hasn't discovered uh, well. People haven't people haven't discovered uh, discovered analytic continuation. So certainly, you know, we keep coming back to this formula: one plus x plus x squared, and so on is equal to one over one minus X. Okay, so take X equals two. So then one plus two plus four plus eight and so on, The power, if you add up the powers of two, that should get you one over, that should get you negative one, right? In the same way, so this, this formula makes perfect sense everywhere. So, you know, people confuse what analytic continuation is. Analytic continuation says there's, there are two functions. There's a function F and it's equal to another function G and now you're going to tell me what f, what g, what the value of g is, and then you're just going to plug in for the value of f where where f doesn't exist, right? So so this is you're going to call f of x, but but this is nonsense really, but the g makes perfect sense, and they happen to agree. So that's exactly what analytic continuation is, except he's still writing it in this way. You know, the sum of the powers of two is negative one. Like what what in the world uh, sense does that mean? So he doesn't understand these things. Uh, but he's he's doing the best he can. He's you know uh, making some uh, incredible progress. Uh, um, yeah, if, if you want, so maybe this one's sort of obviously blowing up. But if we take x equals uh, negative two, uh, for just just to put this closer to what what he's doing for x equals negative two, now we have one minus two plus four minus eight my, uh, plus sixteen minus thirty two and so on. So at least it's an alternating series. It's still doing something crazy for x equals negative two. Uh, whereas on the other side, if I put in negative two, that's a third. So this is exactly the kind of argument that he's, in fact, the whole, the whole paper is, is just a you know, series like this, where he's, he's working out these kinds of you know, crazy uh, identities, starting with exactly the one that we just, just looked at with x replaced by negative x. Okay, so, um, so he looks at the, the sun, which, which is hot and radiating and uh, all over the place, and he, and he can't make sense of it, and the moon. And the moon is sort of calm, and uh, uh, you know, the, the moon series 
is uh, one minus one over two to the s plus one over three to the s minus one over four to the s. So it's just the alternating. He's taking out the the. He's it's just zeta times a, 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 a factor of two, a, pr a prime a contribution at the prime two. So he has the the moon and the sun, and and how they play with each other. So this is why I'm, I told you the story about the uh, lunar eclipse that these two things sort of fit into one each other in this beautiful way. And what he discovers, so he discovers all kinds of crazy formulas, but if you look on page, I told myself it was 94, right here on page 94, he says extrapolating these, so he, he evaluates by, by the, the process that he, by, by basically this kind of thing, he evaluates, so what does he do? He evaluates the sun, for various values for integer and even half integer and half integer values of S. And he evaluates the moon, which he already knows because he knows about zeta of, of the evens, uh, also for integer values, values and half integer values of S. And he just pattern matches. He notices an identity, notices a pattern, and the pattern is exactly this. So here's the pattern. It's that one minus two to the n minus one plus three to the n minus one minus four to the n minus one plus five to the n minus one, and so on. So that's the sun on top and the moon on bottom, except that n, one, one minus one over two to the n plus one over three to the n minus one over n minus one over four to the n, plus one over five to the n, and so on, that this thing always has a pattern and he writes it as negative n factorial, n minus one factorial, negative n minus one factorial, um, two to the n minus one over two to the uh, n minus one minus one over two to the n minus one minus one. I think there's a pi coming pi to the n, and then a cosine of n pi over two, pi to the n, and a cosine this is the one thing you can't do on a blackboard, and a cosine of n pi over two. You just notice this is for integer values of n, and then for half integer values of n, using all of his crazy formulas, and conjectures, uh, I conjecture that this holds for all values of n, and I've convinced you of, of, of its validity for, for lots of uh, values. Uh, conjectures holds for all values of n. Okay, so here's an exercise. Convert this into what we now know as the functional equation, standard functional equation for zeta. He knows the functional equation for zeta. He has analytically, he's not analytically continued the zeta function because he doesn't know about analytic continuation, but he's discovered all kinds of zeros. He discovered, discovered in his search, see what he really wants is if he can figure this out, like what, if he sets n equals to three, um, so what he really wants, what he really wants, again, is n equals three. He's just like single-mindedly uh, set on figuring out what zeta of three is, and he's convinced he can do it if he just gets, if he's just clever enough and has enough uh, formulas, he can work out what, what this thing is when n is equal to three. But when n is equal to three, look on this side, I have cosine of three pi over two. Cosine vanishes. So he gets so he gets zero over zeta of three equals zero. He gets no information. He gets no information, unfortunately. Sadly. Poor Lindsay. Euler. Poor Euler. Poor Euler. But wait a second. Look at what he's discovered. He's discovered that zeta at the negative uh, even numbers vanishes. He discovered, he found. The trivial zeros of the, what we now call the trivial zeros of zeta. 
he knows that zeta of negative twice uh, the even integers vanishes. So um, let's go back to why we should be very suspicious of his sign of x over x work. He knows the zeros of the sine function and puts it into this series. He knows the zeros of the zeta function. These are, in fact, the only real zeros. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't know this yet, but, but these are, uh, these are, let's see, let me try to, okay. These are the only real zeros of zeta. So he might think, he might think by the same token that zeta, okay, maybe if you, if you multiply by s minus one so that it, it's a function that's, uh, oh, you have to do something else to get it to, uh, to be, so this will make it uh, regular at one. I want it to be regular at zero, but let's, let's ignore that for a second. That this, so I know where the zeros of this function it are. So shouldn't I be able to write this as s over uh, negative two times one minus s over negative four times one minus s over negative six times one minus s over negative eight, right? I know what the, what the zeros are times whatever the value is uh, of zeta at zero, which is, uh, which again, he, he works out. So what do you think? Is this identity right or not? Of course not. Uh, for all kinds of reasons. First of all, this doesn't converge. This product doesn't converge. Product does not converge. You need to add these Hadamard factors, these Weierstrass Hadamard factors, to make it converge without changing where the zeros are. Uh, but anyway, it's still missing. It's missing the real, the, the non trivial zeros, the non trivial zeros. which he can't possibly be aware of because he's not thinking of this as a complex valued function, uh, which Euler can't see, can't possibly see because he's working over. He's only letting S be real. The fundamental theorem of algebra still hadn't been proved at this point, right? Um, it had not been proved per, in particular because complex numbers weren't even fully understood as a complex plane. Right. Gauss was the one who... Uh, yeah, uh, between Gauss put... and... I mean, I, I can't believe that Euler didn't uh, know it because he knew e to the i pi. E, e, e to the i theta is uh, cosine theta plus i sine theta. And how could you not right. think to put the imaginary part on that orthogonal axis uh, that parameterizes a circle? But... Historians tell me that, that he didn't. I, I still want to give him credit for it, but I'm, I'm overruled by. So yeah, Gauss and uh, what's his name? Argand or some, somebody uh, apparently were the first to realize the uh, complex plane. And then Gauss gave a proof for the fundamental theorem of, of algebra. This is of course, well after uh, Euler's dead. Okay, so he does not know about uh, the complex zeros, and for that, we're going to go to Rima. Um, so these are uncovered, uncovered by Riemann. So seven, this is 1749. Riemann is, is a century later. This is a century later. 1859. Okay. Any questions so far? Um, kind of an unrelated question, but sure. what is he what is he writing for cosine in the paper? Like oh, C O. That's an S. That's a O. Oh, that's an S. Yeah, yeah. See, uh, it's um, a you know, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm interpreting it as an S. I don't know. I don't know what he's really writing, but uh, it, first he writes down the formula and says that there's a number here. And that uh, times this this factor, and that number goes zero, uh, one zero, negative one zero, one zero, negative one zero. And then he says we could we could write that as cosine of pi pi n pi over two. But how do I convince you that I mean this could be any other sequence? Why does it have to be cosine? And then he evaluates it at at a half. So um, uh, where is it? Somewhere down here, he starts evaluating this at m equals a half. And he works out what gamma of a half must be. Yeah, here it is. Here, here it is when, when it's a half. When it's a half, 
when n equals a half, he gets this series, and then he convinces himself now pi over four is what should come out, and indeed that's what that's what he gets this uh, you know negative a half over root pi. So once he knows that it's right for the the integers and for uh, the half integers by by these incredible formula, he says this has got to be true for all numbers. Of course, all numbers he's not thinking about the complex numbers, but uh, that's how. So Euler understood the re the functional equation for the zeta function. Of course, he didn't understand it the way the way Riemann did. A hundred years later. Okay. Yeah, there's just seen uh, proving that it's true and knowing that it's true. Yeah, but he does. But he does conjecture, and you have to. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you want to be generous enough to him to say he, he really conjectures the full the full formula. All right, so let's go to Riemann's uh, memoir. So new, we're, we're going to be quasi-historical. We're going to skip Dirichlet. We're going to come back to Dirichlet and, and Gauss and, and so on. We're going to keep uh, historical threads. So the next kind of uh, important development is Riemann's memoir. This is 1859, um, where he uh, gives this uh, functional equation properly gives the analytic continuation, gives analytic continuation, continuation, uh, functional equation, equation, and explains and explains how uh, how you should prove Gauss's conjecture, how to prove Gauss's conjecture, what was then known as Gauss's conjecture. Now that now the prime number theorem, that uh, the number of primes up to x really, I mean, he he actually does this the right way. Well, okay, fine. Let's just do it like this. The number of primes up to x is asymptotic to lie of x, which is the integral from two to x dt over log t. So Gauss, um, uh, I'll I'll uh, I, I don't have it uh, queued up, but Gauss computes lots of these tables. And and uh, decides that the primes should be. Uh, he basically, uh, I don't know, comes up with Cramer's law. Of course, Cramer is a uh, hundred years later, one hundred and fifty or whatever. But uh, but but he says roughly that the the density of primes. So Gauss Gauss says density of primes near x just from computation uh, should be like one over log x. And from that, he, he computes this function and, uh, and so on. Apparently, there used to be two letters for S. One was the short S and one was a final S. And so that, that S, Andre, that you, were, that you were asking about in cosine is a final S. Because right next to it is also a regular S. Anyway, some, so right next to that S is also a regular S. But this is the final S. OK, great. Thanks. All right. Um, also, um, was, I guess, before we move on, was this, uh, Euler's last documented, um, attempt at doing anything with Zeta of three? Uh, no. In fact, he does all kinds of other things. Uh, I wanted to give you an exercise now that I think about it. Did I not write it down? Um, how did I not write it down? Uh, I wanted to give you an exercise, which was to derive some of the formulas that he comes up with in this paper. For example, uh, see if you can derive, he does, he, yeah, here we go. Um, see if you can derive, so let me give you another exercise before we get to Riemann. This thing's so cool, can't do it on the blackboard. Uh, let me give you another exercise. Check how good you are compared to Euler exercise, which is in, in this paper of Euler's. Well, I'll post this on the website. Um, the sums of the reciprocals, alternating sums of the reciprocals of the cubes. I could have sworn I wrote this down as something for you guys to do. Yeah, it's right here. I just can't read my own notes. Um, one minus two to the three, one minus two cubed plus three cubed minus one over four cubed, cubed, plus one over five cubed, and so on, that the alternating series of the cubes he evaluates and is uh, pi cubed over 32. So this is, this is him 
passing through this, uh, uh, getting getting to this theorem. So check uh, check how you know how you match with uh, with Euler. Show show this, and then here's a question: Why doesn't why doesn't this tell us zeta of three? How come we can't get zeta of three out of this? It seems like we're pretty close to it. Yeah, uh, Nick, interesting question. The the final s becoming the uh, integral symbol. Well, the integral symbol. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, the integral symbol existed already before, right? The integral symbol is introduced by by Leibniz. Uh, so, anyway, good. Anything else that I meant to tell you but skipped over? Anything else you guys want to say? Okay, right. So. Riemann's memoir gives analytic continuation functional equation, explains how you could prove Gauss's conjecture uh, from uh, knowing the location of the zeros, from knowing, knowing location of zeros of zeta. Okay, and in particular, this would follow from zeta not vanishing on the one line, never vanishing on the one line. And of course, he stayed three one hypothesis. Okay, and for years and years and years. Now, this is using using explicit functions, explicit uh, you know exponential functions, uh, gamma function, and and so on. For years and years, everybody followed Riemann using these explicit functions. It's not until Tate Tate in 1950 in his thesis that he says this has nothing to do with the gamma function or exponential functions. This has everything to do with Poisson summation. The real hero of this uh, analytic continuation, the real, uh, what is it? Uh, the workhorse, the workhorse. These are all red herrings. These are red herrings. The workhorse is Poisson summation. It and only it. Okay, so let's talk about that. Um, let me give you a, so first of all, what is Poisson summation? So theorem, Poisson summation. Again, I know uh, most of you know this stuff, so I'm, I'm going over it slightly uh, more quickly. Poisson summation says if you have a nice function, F is nice, so Schwartz class would be enough. Uh, if you sum F on the, on the, and F as a function from the reals, you sum it on the on all integers, and you sum its Fourier transform on all integers. Those two values will be the same. Okay, let me give you a quick uh, sort of standard proof, standard proof, a quick proof, uh, which is very simple, by the way. And what is the Fourier transform? The Fourier transform, where f hat of c is it's the the correct Fourier transform not the one that, uh, so this is E of uh, minus X C D X and E of anything is E to the two pi I that thing. So the pi belongs here. This is the correct uh, function so that then there's no constants anywhere else. You put the, you put the two pi there and then there's, no, there's nothing else uh, needed elsewhere. Okay. So the standard proof is uh, you make a function, let capital F of X be, you automorphize. So this is uh, automorphize, automorphize F into this thing. Okay, so you take F, you take all of its values on the integers, you add them all up and you shift them by X. And now f of x, big f of x is that function. Uh, this, of course, is a function that's now on r mod z. So we made a function on r mod z. On r mod z, and, and everything converges. I mean, uh, again, we're not going to, uh, this is a crash course. So you, you want to check convergence, go ahead and check it. Give yourself a nice class where, where you can do these things. Um, on r mod z, we use just a standard Fourier analysis. Use Fourier on the circle, 
uh, f of x is equal to a sum over uh, m in z big F of m hat e to the 2 pi i m x, where this hat has a different meaning. It's not this hat. It's a uh, um, it's the integral from zero to one of big F of x e minus m uh, x dx. Okay, so th this is the uh, circle Fourier coefficients, and they're recovered uh, when you integrate against these uh, exponential functions. That gives you the back the value of the function. Now we do a little unfolding trick. So this is called the unfolding trick. I don't know why it's called a trick. It's, there's nothing tricky about it. It just, should just be called unfolding, uh, which is that this integral from zero to one, if I put in what the definition of big F of X is, it's this, it's a sum over N in Z F of X plus N. Um, here, by the way, I could have not, I didn't have to say zero to one. I could have said R mod Z. This is R mod Z. Here I want, I, here I must fix fix some fundamental domain, fundamental domain for R mod Z. I can't write R mod Z anymore because I'm, what I'm about to do requires, uh, X is no longer invariant under X goes to X plus one. I mean, in this summation it is, but once I reverse orders in this value, it's not. Okay, E to the minus MX DX. I reverse orders, everything converges absolutely. I have a sum over n in z, and then an integral, again, over this fixed fundamental domain, let's just call it f, uh, could have been 0 to 1, but uh, we can call it f, fix some fundamental domain f for, for this. f, for example, you can think of as 0 to 1. Um, little f of x plus n, e minus mx dx. Now what? Everybody knows this presumably. What's the unfolding process? Well, we, so we already reversed orders. We already reversed orders. Anytime, it's analytic number theory. So anytime you see two sums, you got it in the wrong way. Yep, now integrate over R. Now, it, now let's make a change. Exactly, we're about to integrate over R. We'll make a change of variables. We'll change the variables, x goes to x minus n. And the whole point is that these things are eigenfunctions are invariant under translation by n. Okay, so, um, so I have a sum over n in z, an integral of f, now I replace x by x minus n, so this is just f of x. This is uh, invariant under this change because e to the two pi i, times an integer is one. So this is E of minus MX, and this is Har measure. It's invariant measure under the group action. Okay, so it's also invariant. I mean, you don't need to know anything about Har measure to know that DX is translation invariant. Um, and what's the, in, what's the range of integration? Well, this used to go from, let's say, N to N plus one. So now I have to take F and translate it by N. And of course, this is the, the unfolding. It's that I, I'm integrating over some region F, and now I'm integrating. This has no ends in it, no ends, and it only appears here. And so I'm integrating the same thing over all of its translates. So this is the same thing as integrating over R. So this is something that we're going to see again and again and again. So I like to do it in the simplest possible context so that when we see it in more complicated contexts, it's familiar. In other words, this uh, circle Fourier transform is the line Fourier transform of the original function f, little f. And now we're done. We set x equals zero. Again, you have to argue that uh, a series converges pointwise. Uh, so if f is, if this little f is, is smooth and, and has nice decay properties and so on. So then I get big F of zero on one hand is equal to a sum over M in Z of big F hat of M, which is, no, sorry, not in negative M. This, this is the definition. The minus sign is supposed to be there. This is just F hat of M. 
uh, so this is little f hat of m times e to the 2 pi i m x, which is 1 when x is 0. And on the other side, it was already a sum over n and 0, uh, n and z, f of n plus 0. And there's your Poisson summation. Okay, so this is sort of the standard proof. Uh, what I want to do, I think we have time. What I want to do is uh, give the, the trace formula proof. So some of you are, are taking Henrik's trace formula class now. Let me give you a very baby trace formula. I don't know if he's, he's planning on doing this or not. I hope I'm not taking uh, uh, the joy out of uh, his, his, if he presents it also. Uh, but let me give you the trace formula. So this is the baby trace formula, trace formula version of the proof. And, and I want to compare these two to see where they have similarities and where they have differences. OK? Any questions so far? Any questions on this proof? Again, I'm assuming every, I know a lot of you have already seen this stuff. So uh, if anyone hasn't or has any questions or comments, please uh, feel free. OK, so so how can we see this as a trace formula? So let's so the first step in a trace formula. So we're given this test function. We're given this test function. F, which just means some nice function that we're going to uh, do our analysis with, we create a kernel. We create, well, let's start with a point pair invariant, point pair invariant, which we'll call little k, little kf, or just little k, which is a function of two variables, x and y. And if I want it to be a point pair invariant, um, I can, uh, what this means is that to be a point pair invariant, means that if I translate both variables simultaneously, I get the same value. And how do I do that? Well, I can do that by just making it equal to f of and x minus. And you're translating by the same amount? By the same amount. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So if there's, so it's, it should just be a function of x minus y. Or the, the so if I translate, uh, we'll do this much more generally, which is why I'm sort of, again, setting up a uh, the, the baby versions. So if I have these two points and I translate both by the same amount, I want this function from this is a function from r squared now to r or c or something. Um, if I translate them by the same amount, I want that to be uh, equal. So that's what's called a point pair invariant. How will I construct it in this setting, and what does it have to do with the test function f? I'll just evaluate. I'll just make this equal to f of x minus one. Okay, so clearly if I replace x by x plus u and y by y plus u, those plus u's and minus u's cancel. Okay, so this is a function on r squared to r. I'm going to automorphize. I'm going to make an automorphic kernel. Make an automorphic kernel. Just like we automorphized. I mean, it's, it's similar. It's sort of doing this proof, but in two variables. And you'll see why there's a you actually gain something when, when you do two variables. So I'm going to automorphize the kernel, make an automorphic kernel, k, big K. Hopefully you can tell the difference between my little k's and my big, if you can read any of my letters at all. Uh, hopefully you can tell the difference. So I'm going to take k of x, y. And let's see, how do I want to automorphize this? I want to sum over the group z, little k, f. If I translate both of these, that's very bad because if I translate both variables, if I want it to be automorphic in both variables and I translate by both variables, well, that's the same value that I'm adding infinitely often. So actually this is the wrong object. The right object is to translate only one of the variables. So this is a function on, on R mod Z cross R. I've only, I've only automorphized one variable. What about the other variable?
Somebody's going to see it. Is it because KF is like F of X minus Y? Exactly. It's a point pair invariant. So this thing is also equal to, I can replace both of these. I can translate both of these by negative N. This is also equal to KF, little KF of X, Y minus N. And because this is a group, traversing over all minus Ns is the same as traversing over all plus Ns. So it's also invariant. It's also automorphic in the second variable, even though it started out only being automorphic in one variable. So that's where the point pair invariance allows you to automorphize only in one variable and pick up the automorphism being automorphic in the other variable. OK. So why do I call this a kernel? The, the word kernel is abused a, a million times in mathematics, uh, overused for too many things. What do you do with a kernel? This is a kernel that you integrate against. So we'll make, we'll make an integral operator, make an integral operator, integral operator out of this kernel, out of, out of this kernel, a Hilbert Schmidt operator. How? You take your function, uh, let's call it G now, in my Hilbert space. My Hilbert space is L2 of R mod Z, L2 of the circle. We're working on the circle. So what is the integral operator applied to G? Well, what does it do? So I need to give you another, so it's an operator, right? I should give, this should give me another function in L2. How do I evaluate it at a, at a point? Of course, L2 functions don't have values. They're, uh, they're only defined almost everywhere. But what should this be? We take, our, uh, we take our function g, we multiply it by our kernel, and we integrate out the variable y over our space. Let's call this space x. x, x is r mod z. I'm trying to give, trying to set up even notation. Uh, even better would, would be to call r if we call R G and Z is gamma, a discrete subgroup of R, discrete and finite uh, area subgroup, then, then this looks like uh, G mod gamma and X is X is G mod gamma. So why do you want it to be an L2 again? Oh, I just want a Hilbert space. Oh, Hilbert space, okay. Yeah, so I want a Hilbert space in which to uh, define an integral, uh, a Hilbert Schmidt operator. Okay. What do you do? It's very simple. You take this thing, you multiply it by this kernel, and you integrate out the y variable, and this becomes a function of the x variable. Okay. So this is just what the, the Hilbert-Schmidt theory of integral kernels looks like, is to, is to create a, you know, some kind of uh, integral operator by uh, taking a two-variable kernel, integrating out one of the variables against uh, some other test function. So this is what the transform, this is the i transform of g. OK, and what is the trace of such an operator? So just the formally, the trace of i means you take this integral. You, so, so you should think of this as like a, a matrix operation, right? The k, k, x, y is like an, a continuous matrix. So what's the trace of a matrix? I, I think of k, x, y as like, you know, Here's uh, x going this way, and here's y going this way, and, and this is the value of k of x, y. So it's a continuous infinite matrix. What's the trace of a matrix? Come on. Everybody knows. Uh, some k of x, x. Exactly. Some k of x, x, which is exactly what we're going to do. Okay, so that's the trace of this of this operator is to sum k of xx. Diagon alley, diagonally, and he winds up somewhere. Yeah. Uh, anyway, diagon alley. You, you guys aren't Harry Potter fans. Yeah. You'll read them with your kids if you didn't read them yourselves as kids. Okay, which I didn't. Um, Right, so we're gonna evaluate this kernel in two different ways. 
we're just like just like here we had sort of two different it's it's this proof is hiding what's really going on and why the trace formula is so powerful so we will evaluate this trace we will evaluate this trace in two different ways once geometrically meaning this is the geometric side because it's just you see the trace of the matrix has two has two wonderful properties the trace of a matrix is the sum of the ii variables it's also the sum of the what's the spectral side if you have a six by six matrix you can sum the diagonal entries or you can do something much more complicated you can compute its uh, eigenvalues eigenvalues and add them up Okay, so the trace of a matrix is both the geometric, just purely going along the diagonal, that's the geometry of the matrix, and, and the spectral side, which is to add up the eigenvalues. Uh, geometrically, so that's the two different ways, and these two things are equal, geometrically and spectrally. Sum of the eigenvalues. This is, these are the eigenvalues. But what says that you can do this still for this trace formula? So we're gonna, we're gonna do it by hand. We're going to do it by hand. You'll see. But it's a general, it's a general uh, process. Um, okay. So to understand, let's do, which one do you want to do first? I'm not sure we'll have time to do both. Should we do the geometric side to start? Okay, let's do the geometric side. The geometric side means this. So this is basically the definition of the trace is the geometric side. So let's evaluate this. So again, what is the, it's, it's number theory, uh, open up sums. So I have a, an integral over x. x is g mod gamma, which is r mod z. It's just a circle. And this big kernel. Now, I have to fix a fundamental domain for this. So fix, again, we're going to unfold. So fix f, uh, a fundamental domain for g mod gamma, a fundamental domain for g mod gamma. So I'm integrating over x, which means I'm integrating over f. K is, remember what K is, it's a sum over the group. It's a sum over the group, the sum over N in the group gamma, which is Z of little K F of X plus N, Y, Y is X, X plus N X DX. So far so good. Okay, I have a sum and another sum. Those are the wrong way around. K F of X plus N X DX. What do you know about K F? Can you move it to the other side? Well, it's a, exactly, it's a point pair invariant. So I can subtract X from both entries. This exactly. is equal to KF of N zero. Has nothing to do with X. So it just pulls right out. So this is a sum over N in gamma, KF of N comma zero times the, the volume. Good thing this, this has times the volume of X, which in our case is one. Everybody see that? Okay, so in this setting, the geometric side is much easier than the, the real trace formula. I mean, everything about this is much easier than the real trace formula, but, it, but I just want to, want to see what this is. And by the way, what is this? What is KF of N0? Remember how we made, how we made it into a point pair invariant was, was this. So this is F of n minus zero. So the, so the geometric side of the trace is exactly the sum over the integers of f of n. So far, so good. That, and that's for this f x minus y case. Um, we've made, we, the, way we, uh, the way we set up the point pair invariant was, was to make it f of x minus y. But then 
there are there other ways i imagine to set um, something like this up so anytime you have a point pair invariant since it only depends on the difference you can define oh, oh, oh i see little f to be the value of this thing at x comma zero yeah yeah right. so it's uh, so these are sort of equivalent if that makes sense right and then what you're saying is okay so the flexibility comes in the task function then exactly exactly so so we use nothing about this except it's you know sort of smooth so that everything that smooth and decaying so that everything that i all the integrals that i'm interchanging and so on are, are legal which will be a problem when you go to do this on uh upper half plane mod sltz for example because you'll have some regions that are going off some cusps that are going off to infinity and you have to deal with those uh in in more delicate ways okay so that's it the geometric side it was was pretty easy let's do the spectral side and it won't be much harder at all for the spectral resolution for the spectral side let's look at k of x y and open this so uh take the the uh spectrally expand this uh expand in the y variable so what i mean by that is what's the spectrum so I have this uh, I have this uh, Hilbert space, which is L two of G mod gamma. There's an operator on this, the Laplacian. The Laplacian on the real line is just two derivatives in x. There are eigenfunctions I can diagonalize with respect to the so the spectral theorem. Spectral theorem says I can diagonalize, can diagonalize diagon alley eyes can diagonalize uh, delta ie uh, there exists this uh, in this case orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions en basis uh, so that the sum of ens gives me my hilbert space and each of these is an eigenfunction of the laplacian And the Laplacian on the ENs is lambda n en. And the lambda ends are, of course, the spectrum of the Laplacian. So, what are these magical functions en? En of x is, of course, just E of nx. These are functions that are invariant under gamma, they're square integrable, and they're eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. What is lambda n? I take two derivatives of an x of e to the two pi i and negative four pi squared n squared. Exactly, negative four pi squared n squared. Okay. So these are the eigenvalues. Notice that they're all negative or, or zero. So it's a negative, the Laplacian is a negative definite. So Laplacian, as I've as I've written it, is negative definite. And uh and so this is this is uh, sort of what will happen more generally. You'll have some Laplace operator on some Hilbert space. You'll want to decompose it into a basis. Here it's a discrete decomposition. More generally, uh, again, if if there are these these cusps, you'll have a continuous decomposition. Um, you'll have a, a a continuous spectrum and not just a discrete spectrum. The eigenvalues won't just be uh, these discrete integer values. Um, so, so the spec the spectral resolution will be an integral part plus a, a summation, but anyway, um, so how are, let's, how are we sure? How are we sure that this is everything? Uh, so here I'm quoting uh, I'm quoting Fourier analysis, just Fourier analysis on the circle that says this exists. But there's a general there's a general spectral theorem that says uh, when you have a self adjoint operator, I should have said this is self adjoint. When you have a self-adjoint operator, there is some spectral resolution. There's some uh, measure on the on the eigenvalues, and some way of diagonalizing the this this operator. Okay, but again, in this case, I'm I'm, I'm just saying uh, fancy words. In this case, it's it's the same. So in the y variable, I can recover the y variable by taking the y transform. So let's say this is a sum over these. Uh, 
integers, let, let's call this the spectrum. Oops. Instead of calling this the integers, let's call this the spectrum of the Laplacian. Of course, the spectrum of Laplacian is uh, governed by integers because it's because these are the, the eigenvalues, but m in the in the spectrum of f uh, k f um, how do I say hat in this variable hat in the y variable m e m z e m y in other words I'm uh, I'm projecting onto the this component of this vector space on the on the mth component of the vector space. And what is the projection where k hat f x uh, m is the integral over x f um, of y e m y dy. I guess this is em bar. One of these needs a bar. So again, what am I doing? I'm project. This is the projection, projection onto uh, the space spanned by em. So you take these. You take your function k in the x is fixed. So for fixed x, for fixed x, I take the the function in y. I project it onto the the mth component, and then I sum over all the projections, and I recover the original function. This is exactly what we did before, except now we're doing it in, in two variables. Okay. So here's where some magic is about to happen. What is this? This is just, this is just I applied to E, e M bar. The integral, the kernel, this uh, uh, projection of the kernel is just the, the operator itself, but these functions are, are, are eigenfunctions and they're invariant under the group action. So let's, uh, let's analyze this. So what do I wanna say? Um, again, if I, if I put this into, um, if I open this up, so we'll unfold uh, yet again, unfold. So I have a sum over an, an integral over a fundamental domain for X a sum over uh, integers n in z k f of x plus n y e m y bar dy. Reverse orders n in z integral over f um, k k f x plus n y e m y bar dy. So far, so good. I haven't done anything. Um, what is this? This is the same as kf of x y minus n because it's a point parent variant. So I can move the group action to the y variable. And then I make a change of variables. y goes to y plus n. I can move that group action over to this variable. This is Haar measure. This is Haar measure invariant, which is invariant under this action. So I can I can move the n over here, but the n dies over here because this is an eigenfunction. This is an automorphic function. It's an, it's invariant under translation by by n. So so we saw this already, but now we're seeing it sort of from a, uh, a higher plane or something. So just as before, now we complete we complete the unfolding, and we have an integral over g all of, over all of g. G is R of uh, k f of x y e m y bar d y so far so good and now we can do one more thing we can use the fact that this is a um we can write this let's see how, how do i want to do this uh i can make another change of variables um well let's just write out what it what it is Let's just write out what it is. This is f of x minus y um, e to the uh, e of negative my dy. And uh, let's make a change of variables. Let z, 
let z equal x minus y. So dz is equal to negative dy. X is fixed. X is fixed here. So I have an integral. This is going to go in the opposite direction, but this is also going to go in the opposite direction. So I get back to a regular uh, direction. In other words, this, this minus sign will get canceled out. I get f of z and then e of minus m. Um, what do I have here? What do I have here? Z is equal to y, uh, x minus, so y is equal to x minus z. So this y becomes an x minus z minus m x minus z. Okay, but this function is, is also a, uh, a character. This function is a character. And so uh, this, this is equal to E of minus MX times E of looks like MZ. I'm missing a minus sign somewhere. I'm off by a minus sign. <laughs> I like the smack talk in the, in the chat. So anyway, this is, a, this is just a constant that pulls out. So this is E of minus MX. And this is something that happens uh, in general. And here I'm supposed to get F hat of, uh, I guess, minus M. Somehow I'm off by a minus sign somewhere. Okay, let's finish this up. We're already out of time. Um, so let's put all of that back into the spectral side of the trace formula. So I had this sum over K hat and E. So let's say, let's say what this is. This is K F of X, Y is a sum over M in Z of K hat. K hat, we just worked out what that is. It's F hat of minus M E minus M X times E of M Y. E of M Y. I'm sure I'm off by a minus sign somewhere. Let me just, we'll, we'll in the interest of time, put, put both of those there. Oh no, actually, I think I'm right. I think I do want exactly this. I think I do want exactly this. Okay, and now I said x equal to y. And now I integrate over x dx. And this is the trace, which we know to be the sum of uh, f of n. And now this is the spectral side. And, and this is uh, E squared, E norm squared is one. This again is the volume, which is one. And then here's uh, this same sum running over the integers. All right, so that's, that's the sense in which this is a baby trace formula. There's a spectral uh, way to do it and a, uh, and a geometric way. Very good. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, Poisson summation uh, next time and and uh, quickly do Riemann's memoir and the prime number theorem. Any questions? <laughs>